Mr. Bill Cross works in Leeds and he's got a particular interest in uh, robotic prostatectomy. And he's going to tell us whether it's better or not. My guess is if you're using it, we may well hear that it's better. He tells me he doesn't do laparoscopic and he only occasionally does open prostatectomies when he has to. So, Bill, can I ask you to. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do today is basically cover three areas. And I'd like to talk to you as interactive as possible. So if you've got a question at any point, stick your hand up. If I don't see you, shout out. Please do. Okay, so as I say, the talk is going to be in three parts. First part, I'm going to talk about the robotic system. What is robotics? Now, how many people work in a centre which offers robotic surgery? Quite a lot. How, okay, keep your hands up. How many people actually work in a centre which offers laparoscopic prostatectomy? So the vast majority and the rest of you presume will offer open prostatectomies. Okay, so a lot of you will actually know a great deal of what I'm going to actually tell you. But if you have got any questions, please shout out. So the first part is going to be about what, what is robotic surgery. Secondly, I'm going to cover a few what I think are salient points in the actual procedure. Points which are important when it comes to counselling a patient about the potential morbidity associated with the procedure and where perhaps robotic or minimally invasive technology has advanced the actual operation. And then finally, I'm going to discuss with you interactively as to is robotics prostatectomy a better procedure? Now firstly, what is the robotic system? Well the robotic system, is, there's nothing fancy about it. There's three components. There's the... That's actually remote to the actual operating table. So the surgeon sits in the console and performs the operation. And you don't actually need to scrub up to do the operation. And you don't actually even need to be in the same room as the patient to do the procedure. And you've all probably seen in the media or in the newspapers about American military being operated on in Iraq, uh, by, in, in Afghanistan, by surgeons in the States. Obviously there are publicity stunts, but nevertheless it is technically possible. So that's the console, surgeon console. The second part, probably one of the most important parts, is the patient side cart. That is the actual robotic bit, and that's where the instruments are, the instruments are attached to the patient side cart, and that's where the operation takes place. And then you've got the third bit, which is the stack, where all the electronics, or most electronics, sit. And it's very much like a laparoscopic stack. So let's go through each of these bits separately. Right, the patient side cart. Now the original Da Vinci robots had three arms. Now the modern machine has four arms. So you've got one arm which holds the camera, and the camera is a 3D high definition camera. And it's much better than the 3D cinemas you may have been to, or the 3D TVs you may have seen. It's a very high quality 3D camera. So that is held by the middle arm there. Which leaves you three other arms. And into those arms you can put a variety of instruments, and I'll pass some instruments around in a minute. But that's great, you've got three arms. Now I've only got two arms, which means I can either have two left arms, or I can have two right arms. And I can say to the robot, well I want two left arms, but I want occasionally my right arm at the console to control my left arm. So it's very clever. It's quite nice to have that extra arm. In the past we've always relied on an assistant, a table side assistant to retract, etc. But to get a table side assistant to track properly, they've either had to operate with you for a long time to get to know what you do, or you've had to tell them what to do. So it does save a little bit of time when you can actually retract yourself using one of the extra arms. So that's the robot, the patient side cart. And these are the instruments. And you've all probably seen the Citroen advert, which has got the arm which can move around in all sorts of varieties of angles. And the robot can do the same. It's got a much better range of movement than what my arm has got. And it can spin around in all sorts of angles. And attached to the end of the arm, you've got the instrument. Okay, the end or wrist instrument. Now you've all probably seen laparoscopic instruments. And laparoscopic instruments don't have the wristed movement. 
And laparoscopic, laparoscopic surgery is great, the outcomes are fantastic, and I will never try and compare robotics with laparoscopic surgery. But with laparoscopic instruments, you are restricted by the instruments. Whereas in robotics, you've got these endo-wristed instruments, which replicate the human wrist and the human fingers. And I'll pass these around so you can have a play with them. Instruments, you can, you can move in, out, left, right, up and down, you can spin around, you can do a whole host of things with the instruments. Now let's go to the surgeon's console. Now the surgeon looks in through the eyepiece and it, as I say, it's a 3D view you get because the actual camera consists of a left and a right camera and the left image is, is obviously goes to the left eye, the right image goes to the right eye. So you get a proper 3D view which you get by looking through the islands, and you rest your forehead on a plate there. You then put your hands inside the instrument and, and you grip these pincers. And then when you move the hand instruments, the robot replicates you. And you can do some very clever things. You can say to the robot, when I move an inch, I want you to move a millimetre. So you can scale your movements. So if you're doing something very fine, you can be doing this, the robot can do something very, very delicate, and that's quite a nice facility. Also, the robot removes your tremor, and we've all got a tremor. If you magnify your movements up enough, you'll see the fine tremor, and the robot gets rid of that. Especially if you've had a big night out, it's quite useful. All right, so that is the hand instrument there. I'm sorry, but it doesn't uh, project very well. But you basically grip the pincers and to start the robot you just do that and then away you go. Right, and I'll show you what it does. Okay, let's see, he's moving his hands and the robot just simply replicates the movements. A lot of patients think that you just simply put the robotic instruments in, type in robotic prostate. <laughs> I gave a talk to a, a group of GPs in Leeds recently, and that's what they thought as well. Uh, so I did have to explain to them that unfortunately it was a urologist who was operating on it, and that's why we had the complications we've had. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, it basically just replicates what you do. If you make a mistake, it makes a mistake. There's nothing clever about it. Uh, <laughs> this isn't that horrid. <laughs> okay. Right. So that's the robotics system. Any questions about the robot? Can I ask how much that would cost? That whole yeah, system? yeah, I'll come to that at the end. But it's about, <laughs> it costs you between one and a half million and two million, depending on which one you want. Right. <laughs> that's, that's not where the expense stops, all right? Okay. Buying it is the least of your worries. Mm -hmm. Now, any other questions about the robotic system? How long does it take to train? How long does it take to train? Yeah. That's a very good question. How long does it take to train to use the actual instrument or to do the procedure? To learn how to use the actual instrument doesn't take very long. If you go to, uh, and visit a centre which does a lot of robotics, you can learn how to use the robot the basic uh, technology in a matter of weeks, and people do. Uh, but to learn how to do, then go on and do an operation, obviously takes a lot longer. But the, it's, it's, the company is called Intuitive, and it is quite intuitive on how to use the robot. It's very clever name. So is there any particular competencies or any that you decide you want to stay competent? Yes, there is. The, the robot company expects you to go and visit one of their centres. There's two centres in Europe which uh, you're expected to visit at your own expense to be signed up. And you don't just go as a consul surgeon who take your surgical team with you. Uh, so all the surgical treat team should get signed off. Yes? No, most, in most centres in the UK, the robot is used by a variety of specialties, but urology is the predominant user at the moment. Worldwide, the fastest growing specialty is gynaecology in terms of robotics. Is there a time to 
is there a difference in how you do the procedure? And how many takes to do the procedure? Yes, there is. I'll come to that. Everybody happy with the robot? Okay, let's move on to the procedure. Now, I know you all know what the prostate gland is. This is just to orientate you to the videos I'm just going to show. The prostate gland sits here below, behind the pubic bone, above the pelvic floor and in front of the rectum, below the bladder. And between the bladder and the back front wall of the rectum lie the seminal vesicles. And the testicles, which produce sperm, are connected to the back of the prostate by the tu a tube called the vas. And the vas runs up from the scrotum through the inguinal canal and then joins the back of the prostate. And what's the function of the prostate? Anybody know? What does it do? You know, when a man asks you, can I manage without my prostate? What do you say? Yes. You can. So what does it do? PSA liquefies semen. What the prostate gland does, it's an exocrine gland, it produces a lot of secretions which contribute to uh, semen. So only a small component of semen is sperm produced by the testicles. The vast majority of the rest of semen is fluids produced by the prostate gland. So yes, you can manage without your prostate gland, you're just simply going to have a dry ejaculation if you can ejaculate. And those secretions are temporarily stored in the seminal vesicles. So when a man ejaculates, the seminal vesicles contract and uh, semen is passed along this tube here, the ejaculatory duct, and out through the penis. So prostate, vas, which connects the prostate to the testicles, seminal vesicles, front of all the rectum. Remember that. Because the prostate is deep down in the pelvis, <coughs> you have to... Now, sorry if the, the slides don't project very well. It is a high definition projector. I think it's just the ambient light. Is that just the Can we get a bit of a in those lights as well? Yes. That's slightly better. <coughs> sorry. Now, because the prostate's deep down into the pelvis, you need to be able to get access to allow the robot to get access uh, to the prostate gland. So, in a normal prostatectomy, or normal, an open prostatectomy, the patient lies flat or slightly head down. But with a robotic prostatectomy, we put the patient in a position called steep Trendelenburg, and it's incredibly steep. And we occasionally have our patients slip. <laughs> and, uh, so we always test it at the beginning of the operation to make sure they don't want to slip. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the nephritis holding a patient up. Uh, it was one of the first robotic lists, and she was a little bit obviously shocked. Uh, but uh, so, steep trend Dellenberg, and what that does is that it allows the abdominal fat to drop out of the way. And most of the patients who I operate on are lean to middle aged men or elderly men, and they've got a lot of abdominal fat. And it just allows that to just move out of the way. And then the robot comes in between the legs, so the legs are apart. The robot, the patient side part comes in between the legs, the robot reaches over the patient and then the instruments are inserted, so the pubic area is here, and we put six ports in, and through the ports pass the instruments. Now you may remember that the robot has only got four arms, so what, what do we use the other two for? Well we have a patient, a patient side assistant, and he or she puts two laparoscopic instruments in, and, we, and they retract on and suck out any blood. Of course, with robotic prostate, we don't get any bleeding. But, but just in case you do get some bleeding, we need a table side surgeon. So it's a steep trend up there. And they have to be reasonably fit from a cardiovascular point of view to be able to maintain that position for anywhere between two and three hours. And it can be an anaesthetic challenge. So this is the patient, head down, so his head's down here, his pubic area is just in front of there, the robot's reached over and the instruments have been put through the ports. So, anatomy. This is the side view of the prostate gland, as I mentioned before, it sits below the bladder in front of the rectum and the seminal vesicles lie between the rectum and the bladder. Now life would be very easy if that was all the anatomy we had to really concern ourselves with, but unfortunately it's not. Now in an open prostatectomy, 
the vast majority of surgeons do what we call a retrograde prostatectomy. That means that they start off down at the apex of the prostate and then work backwards. So they, they divide the urethra and then retract the prostate backwards and work backwards. But you can't do that if you're doing a laparoscopic or a robotic procedure because the camera can only point in that direction. You can't look backwards. So we do it in an anti-grade fashion. We set off at the top of the prostate, separate it from the bladder, work around the seminal vesicles, down the back front wall of the rectum, and then do the urethra at the end. So we excise it anti-gradely. So there's one difference there between the open and the minimally invasive approach. And as I said, the anatomy is a little bit more complex and there's a lot of pipe work and, uh, around the prostate gland. And I'm sure you're well aware of this. The blue structures, and I wish they were blue, uh, in your life, <laughs> are the veins. And the penis has a fantastic blood supply. And it's also got a huge venous drainage as well. And if you inadvertently go into this, this is called a dorsal vein complex, and this is the bit which a lot of people forget about, one of the tributaries of that, it, it, it bleeds, and it can be quite torrential. So the veins we have to take into consideration, obviously the arteries, and also the nerves. And it is these nerves which actually provide ne neural sense nerve fibres to the penis, which are important for erections. Now, traditional teaching is that you've got a nerve bundle on the left and on the right. In fact, you've got a sheet of nerves which go between the rectum and the prostate gland. And it's that sheet of nerves. Yes, they are condensed in the left and right aspects, but there is a sheet which is important for erections. Now, you've all seen MRI scans this morning. As I say, I apologise again about the quality of the image. The prostate gland is here, and the rectum full of gas is here. Now, the nerve bundles sit there, okay. left and right, but there is a sheet of nerves here. This is a tissue section from a male fetus, and that's the prostate gland in blue, the urethra in the center, the front wall of the rectum there. And it looks like there's a big space, doesn't it, between the back wall of the prostate and the front wall of the rectum. And you think, well, how can anybody damage a rectum when they're taking a prostate out? Well, in fact, this is a fetal uh, sample, and the prostate hasn't enlarged. It's not gone through puberty. And when the prostate goes through puberty, it obviously enlarges, and this, uh, this tissue here becomes compressed. It's called denon bilious fashion. And in fact, it's not much thicker than two sheets of paper. So you've got bundles there, and you can see the nerve fibers. They've been stained brown. Can everybody see them, left and right? There's actually a few more here, and a lot of people forget about those. This is referred to as the veil of Aphrodite, and there's a lot of American surgeons uh, taking a lot of time resecting that out. They feel that it actually improves post-operative sexual function. I think that's controversial. Right, now, this isn't going to project very well, but remember this picture. Prostate in front, rectum behind, nerve bundles there. <coughs> See if it works. Oops, get back. Can you see it? Before John says, this is a typical view for a robot. We normally get a fantastic view. Uh, the prostate, it's a shame, so I'm sorry. Uh, but the prostate gland is here, it, it has been taken off the bladder. Uh, so, what you're doing is you're looking inside the prostate gland, and the nerve bundle is here and the rectum is behind. I think you're going to actually put the videos into the presentations later on, so you will be able to see this uh, as it should be seen. But you can see the robot, one on there, one there, and a third one there, and the fourth one's holding the camera, and the console surgeon is retracting with one left arm, he's using the other left arm for retraction as well, and he's using his right arm to actually divide the neurovascular bundle off. So the rectum's there, the back wall of the prostate gland is there, and the right neurovascular bundle is here. Now when you actually see this video, when it's part of the CD or whatever you get at the end, you will notice that it, there's a lot of blood. Well, in fact, there's not much blood. This is a magnified view. And normally surgeons, when they see bleeding, they coagulate uh, the blood vessels. That's they seal the blood vessel using electric current. 
Now, we don't like to use any electric current whatsoever near the neurovascular bundle. And the reason for that is that if the, the, when we use co uh, coagulation, you actually dissipate an incredible heat into the surrounding tissues, and that can actually damage the nerves. So we do this using a cold cut, and that's why there's a little bit of blood around the neurovascular bundle. Now, the next most important structure is the sphincter. The sphincter sits down at the apex, and is very, very difficult to see. Now, this is a urethroscopy, a flexible urethroscopy, to show you the sphincter internally. Now, that's a, a stricture in the penile urethra. And we'll go through that, we'll negotiate that, and we're through. We're now into the bulbar urethra, which is the U-bend. And there, can you see the sphincter? Oh, you'll get a better view in a second. There, it's there, close. And I ask the patient to do a pelvic floor contraction. You see the pelvic floor contraction around the sphincter? There. There. So the sphincter's closed. I'm going to go through the sphincter, push my way through, and then I did a pelvic floor contraction to stop me getting through. <laughs> Experimentalum on the side of the prostate. You can see the lobes of the prostate, left and right, going through the prostate, blood and neck, and inside the body. <coughs> so that's what the sphincter looks like internally. Now, this, again, I have to apologize, but the prostate gland is here, so the view we've got is from the front here. There's some fat in front, and then we hit the vein. <coughs> Seal that. It's okay to use electricity in this area because it's away from the nerves. So we seal the veins. I do it slightly different. What this guy has done is actually put a suture around here to try and tie off the veins before he cuts through. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I just go straight through and then I rely on the, the, the gas pressure to inflate the patient using carbon dioxide and increase the pressure and often that pressure is sufficient to stop most of the bleeding. So I cut through it because I feel that if you tag it off, you distort the anatomy slightly. So I cut through it and then I see I'm an overserve. I don't know what you do, John. Do you tie before you cut? Yeah, yeah you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a second video. And what I wanted to show you with this video was how difficult it is to actually identify the apex of the prostate gland. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but that's the catheter in the urethra. So the urethra is going to be cut now. But it can be quite difficult, especially if you've got an apical tumour, differentiating where the two tumour finishes and, and where the extra prostatic tissue starts. <coughs> and, and if you go to the textbooks, you see these fantastic pictures of the sphincter mechanism. We don't actually see that during the procedure. And it is very hard to know exactly how far away you are from the apex of the prostate and how close you are to the sphincter mechanism. So, that's the procedure. Any questions about the operation? Have most of you actually seen a prostatectomy being performed? Yeah. It's worth going to watch. Now, it, is a robotic prostatectomy better or not? Who thinks it's better? Okay. If you're a father or husband or whatever and needed a prostatectomy, would you recommend a robotic prostatectomy above a open or a laparoscopic prostatectomy? We do a laparoscopic. You do a laparoscopic. So, mixed views. Okay. So that's the qu question is better than what? Is it better than active surveillance? Is it better than radiotherapy, either brachytherapy or radiotherapy? Is it better than an open or a laparoscopic prostatectomy? <coughs> and how can it be better? Is it better oncologically? Is it better in terms of post recovery of post-operative continence or post-operative sexual function? Is it better in terms of the, man, the time it takes to return to normal activities? And what about the health economics? I'm definitely not going to compare it to active surveillance or radiotherapy 
What I'm going to focus on is open prostatectomy and also these post-operative outcomes. Now if you go to Intuitive's website, now they, they have changed it recently. If you could, most patients have visited this website before they come and see me. And they think, by reading from what they've read, that it's much better. It's better in terms of oncological outcomes. You know, it doesn't exactly say that in the website, but it suggests that. And they also think that they're going to return to work in a couple of weeks, and that they'll be constant as soon as the catheter is removed, and they'll be able to have erections in a matter of weeks as well. That's simply not true. But that's what is suggested, not only in the robotic website, intuitive website, but in some of the American uh, medical centers' websites. So you have to be careful in what you read. Unfortunately, like in a, in a lot of areas in neurology, uh, we have what let ourselves down, and there is no prospective randomized controlled trial comparing robotic or laparoscopic prostatectomy with open prostatectomy. So all we've got is data from longitudinal studies. So let's look at the first outcome, oncological outcome. Before I just show you the results, I think it's important just to recap the staging system. As you all know, T2 means that the prostate cancer is confined to the gland, and that's subclassified into A, B, and C. A if it's involving less than half of one lobe, B if it's more than half one lobe, and C if it's bilaterally. And T3 is when the disease has unfortunately extended beyond the prostate gland into the extra prostatic tissues. And 3B is once it's gone into the seminal vesicles. The staging system has recently been reclassified, and a T3B also includes disease which is microscopically extended into the blood and neck. That was once referred to as T4. And the other important thing to consider, obviously, is whether it's surgical positive margin rates. So, I would say, well, unfortunately, we're limited to uh, longitudinal studies. Uh, just basically reference two papers. Uh, a study, and the vast majority of the patient data is from the American centers. So, there is some reporting bias and selection bias here. 20, nearly 27,000 open patients and about 9,000 robotic patients from a variety of centres. These are mainly academic centres, okay? not your community-based uh, urology centres. And the first thing you see when you go to the website, we are trying to sell robotic technology, is the difference in the positive surgical margin rate. And they'll often quote that if you go and have an open prostatectomy, you've got a 24% chance, roughly, of having a positive margin. If you have a robot, 10% less chance of having a positive margin. But you've got to look into the data into a little bit more depth. Who are these people operating on? If you look at the open series, nearly two-thirds of the men have T2. One-third of them, unfortunately, have T3. In the robotic series, three quarters of the men were T2 and only a quarter had T3. There is going to be a difference in the positive margin rate, isn't there? They've operated on a different cohort of men. So let's look at the positive margin rate for the different stages of disease. And there's a quite a wide range of results. But if you look at the T3 positive margin rate, it's almost identical. So what this suggests is, is that if your disease is outside the prostate gland, it doesn't really matter how the operation is performed. The chances of you having a positive margin rate are almost identical. Now this is historical data, but nevertheless, it's still relevant. But what if you've got if your disease is still confined to your prostate gland? Does the robotic technology offer an advantage? Well, looking at this, it does suggest that, doesn't it? It looks like if you're a man, if you're a man who's got a T, or if you've got a patient who's got a T2 disease, pathological T2, he's got a less chance of having a positive margin if he has an invasive procedure. I can't say whether that's true or not, but I think there, 
My impression is, is that that's probably right. And the reason for that is that you do get a fantastic view of the prostate gland with the 3D camera. And the view is better than that you get with the open procedure. Now, I know it's dependent on your surgeon and your surgical team, but I think I do believe that the view is better. And that may account for the reduced positive margin rate with T2 disease. Not only is the view better because of the camera, but you do get less bleeding as well, which may improve your positive margin rate. But I have no evidence to support that. So that's oncological outcome. What about incontinence and sexual function? Same so two studies. If you look at the data, it's quite a wide range in what's reported. And the reason for that is that people uh, vary depending on their definition of continence. Now, my definition of continence is that somebody is completely pad free. Not only are they pad free, but they're satisfied with their urinal symptoms. And hopefully, they don't have any urinal symptoms. I do accept that they may occasionally require a security line if they're physically active or they're doing sport, but they should be pad free. Now, a lot of the early open studies allowed men to be defined as being continent, even if they were using one pad a day. And I think that probably accounts for part of this, one of the reasons why there's such a wide range, and also different surgical technique, different surgical teams. It's often reported in the robotic literature that you get a faster return to continence with the robotic procedure. There is no evidence to support that. And I think a lot of that is on the back of but the robotic uh, series start to measure continence much earlier than what the traditional open series measured the continence at. Most of the, the people in the open series only have their continence assessed at three months or later, whereas now we start to assess continence as soon as the catheter is removed. But I, I personally start assessing them immediately. As soon as that catheter is out, we assess, are they continent or are they not? And, and we, we give patients questionnaires, so it's patient, uh, the information is obtained directly from the patient. It's not down to the clinician or the CNS who sees the patient. In some series, there is an early return to continence because they've adapted the surgical technique. I'll come back to that later. What about erections? Again, the robotic series started to assess erections or sexual function much earlier in the post operative course than what the open series had done. And the open series is uh, it's quite a historical data set now, but if you have a unilateral nurse bearing operation, the chance of you being able to get uh, an erection at two years post surgery is anywhere between 17 and 53 percent. If you're fortunate to have a bilateral nurse bearing operation, it does increase the chance that you would be able to obtain normal erections, and your chances are anywhere between 36% and 86%. Uh, that's quite impressive, isn't it? <laughs> I do doubt that. But if you have a robotic procedure, this data does suggest that you've probably got a higher chance of getting normal erections. There's no reason why you should get, have a higher chance to be able to get normal erections. It's down to surgical technique. Yes, the view's slightly better. If, you've got, if you have a bilateral nurse bearing operation by a good open surgeon, your post-operative sexual function is just going to be the same as, a, as having a procedure done by a good laparoscopic or robotic surgeon. I don't think there's much difference in the outcomes. If I was a patient, I want to know what are my chances of being cured oncologically, what's the chance of me being, having normal continence and normal section, sexual function. That's what we call the trifecta. I want, I want everything. Okay? And I know we can't off, uh, guarantee everything, but if you go and visit Vit Patel in Florida, who is in a very swish robotic suite, um, he's looked at his data and and he's very lucky, he's, he can, because he's operating in a, in a big American center, he can sort of select his patient group. And he does operate on a lot of guys who've got early, low-grade disease. Vast, vast majority of his patients are T2, at least 6 or 7. Very few are T3. And this group, 
I think it was 97% of this group were T2 or less. And he's looked at what percentage of patients obtain all three outcomes. So they're cured, or potentially cured, they're continent, and they can get erections with or without the aid of Viagra or an alternative. And these figures are pretty impressive. At 12 months, 86% of that patient group obtained all three outcomes. It's very, very good. Now, comparing that to the, open, the literature from the open series, at 12 months, it's 40%, and at two years, 60% of patients obtain a trifecta, and that's from Memorial Sloan Kettering from Peter Skydino series. But it's a different patient group. Now, you asked the question about operative time. It depends on your surgeon. You know, as you probably know, uh, the surgeons who do open prostatectomies in an hour, there's some in the next door in the next door theatre who take three hours. Everybody varies. And these are just mean operative times. So an open operation generally takes anywhere just over two hours. A robotic operation does take longer. This series is predominantly made up of patients from two big American centres. And Vic Patel generally does the operation in just over an hour robotically. So he does skew the data slightly. But most robotic surgeons are taking anywhere between two and three hours. Slightly longer than an open procedure. And the reason for that is partly that you've got to prepare the patient for the robot. You've got to position them. You've got to put the ports in. Then you've got to, and then you've got to dock the robot. You've got to attach all the, you know, the put a bunch of the instruments in. You've got to attach the instruments to the robot. You, at the end of the operation, you've got to undock the robot, and that adds anywhere between 20 minutes and half an hour, depending on how slick your team is. So it does definitely take longer to do it robotically. Does it make a difference in terms of blood loss? Well, earlier on I did infer, but it does, and and that's partly due to the fact that you we actually inflate the patient with carbon dioxide. So there's an increased pressure within the pelvis and that reduces a lot of venous bleeding. There has been occasions though where I've had blood loss <laughs> nearer that though, I must admit. Uh, but what is the transfusion rate? Uh, I don't think there's any difference between the transfusion rate between open and minimally invasive prostatectomy and it's probably in the order of between one and three percent. Uh, how many times do you have to convert from a, mid, from a robotic to an open procedure? Well, it depends where you are on the learning curve. Very early on in your learning curve, you're going to convert because you haven't got the confidence or the skills to, continue, uh, to complete the operation. And the, the, but in this series, uh, the conversion rate was three in a thousand. Uh, our first 100, we converted about five or six six patients. Most of those were at the beginning of the learning curve, and we are we're definitely still on our learning curve, but we did we had to convert somebody recently last two weeks ago because we couldn't complete, we couldn't get a good view with a robot. How often does the robot fail? About four times in a thousand is the reported incidence. We had it fail once and the arms just would not move and we had to then convert to the open procedure. The problem with that is, is that when you do convert, if you haven't got the laparoscopic skills, you can't convert to a laparoscopic procedure, you then convert to the open procedure. And we converted to the open procedure, you lose your pressure and you get a lot of bleeding. So it is quite difficult when you do convert. And what the management are most interested in is how long do the patient stay in hospital after you've had the procedure? In most centres, the men go home the next day. Now, in America, most of the large academic centres have got the luxury of a patient hotel, which is the opposite side of the road. So the patients go across the road into the patient hotel and they're looked after by a nurse in the hotel before they actually are discharged home. We haven't got that luxury in Europe, and our patients are discharged straight from hospital to home. But most people who are robotic prostatectomy go home the next evening. So the guys I'm going to do tomorrow will hopefully go home Friday evening. If they have to travel any distance, they'll go home on Saturday morning. 
but occasionally they do have to stay a bit longer if they've got an excessive drain out, for instance. Compared to our open series, most of our open uh, prostatectomies go home day three, day four. So there's not a lot of difference. What about complication rates? Now, the comp overall complication rate, I think, is very similar. I don't think there's much difference. Um, I also believe that the uh, complication rate with robotic surgery uh, does obviously depend where you are on your learning curve. And obviously, at the beginning of your learning curve, you're going to have more complications. But there's not much difference between the different approaches. That's fine, what the literature suggests. Economics, <coughs> how much they cost? Well, it costs between one and a half million and two million to buy a robot. And the reason for the difference in price is that you can now get a robot which has two consoles. So you can have two surgeons sitting or operating. It's basically a training console. The very few people are going to purchase one of those. Perhaps some of the big American academic centers might buy one for training. But it's about one and a half million to purchase. But the spending doesn't stop there. Unfortunately, it costs about £100,000 a year for a maintenance contract, and they do break down quite regularly. So you've got to have a maintenance contract. And let's say it's £100,000 a year at the moment. And also it costs more per case, because you're using the instruments, the consumables. Now those instruments can only be used 10 times. Obviously they're not worn out after 10 times, but they've got a little chip in, them, in the in the head unit, and that chip knows that it's done a procedure, so it knocks one of your ten procedures off. Now, there was a belief that the chip only counted down when it went for the autoclave. So there was an Indian set that thought, ah, we want autoclave our instruments. <laughs> We're just winding down. <laughs> and, uh, but the chip's cleverer than that because it knows that there's been a time gap between cases. <laughs> so actually, they should have already placed their instruments. <laughs> so after 10 times, it's in the bin. All right. Is there a reason for that? Is that? The reason for that is the FDA. The, the company said that the actual instruments, obviously it depends, the scissors were out quicker than, say, the forceps. And, but the, the trials suggested that they were okay up to about 30 times. But the American FDA said, well, no, 10 times. And I'm sure insurers have had an input into that decision making, but uh, and that's where they make most of their money now is out of the consumables. And one of the problems is, problems is, is that it's a monopoly. There's only one company at the moment producing a robot. There are a number of, a number of companies that have robots in the pipeline, and hope that that will drive down the costs. So in conclusion, <coughs> the robot, it's just a tool. It's no different than any other surgical tool. There's nothing clever about it. Yes, it does make my life easier. I've got a fantastic 3D high definition magnified view. I've no tremor. And uh, I've got the endo wrist, which can replicate my, my wrist movement. So it does make my life easier. And it makes the, uh, the, the surgical team's life easier as well, because they can see the same, well, almost the same view as me, but it's in 2D. So they can see what I'm actually doing. And that does help. It's a little bit more interaction. The technology is definitely advancing. And I think in the future, minimal invasive surgery well, will be the future. Uh, I don't think we'll be having this discussion in five, ten years' time. I think robotic technology will be much better than open, the open alternative. And the reason for that is, is that we're moving over to single port surgery now. So patients are going to have just one single scar. The instruments are not just going to be wristed. They're going to be multi-articulated, so they'll move like a snake. That technology already exists. And there's a Canadian robotic company which is going to incorporate that technology into their robot. Tactile feedback is a problem. You need no sensation when you're using the robot. You don't know how the tissue's feeling. Just purely go by vision. And hopefully that will be incorporated in the next generation of robots. I think the challenge is, is to incorporate that technology in a disposable fashion. <coughs> I spoke to somebody at Rolls-Royce, and they went to Intuitive because they wanted a robot building. 
and they went to Intuitive and were disappointed they came back and actually built their own robot. I was chatting and said, well, you know, have you got tactile feedback? He said, oh, it's not a problem, it's easy to actually build in tactile feedback. The reason why they don't do it is for, because they're a bit like Apple, they want it to come in with the next generation of robots, and also they want it to be disposable, so they have to produce this technology cheaply. And also the robots now, the instruments are incorporating lasers and imaging devices to aid surgery. The procedure, well the procedure, just like the technology, is continuing to advance. There's no doubt about it. With the introduction of minimum invasive prostatectomy, the procedure has advanced during the last decade. You know, the steps are slightly different. There is much more care now taken in terms of the neurovascular bundle resection, the uh, reconstruction of the posterior blood and neck, etc., um, and also uh, posterior to the urethra, the sphincter mechanism. So I think that robotics has made the open surgeons sit up a little bit and perhaps consider what they're actually doing and refine their technique. But there's still a long way to go. There is a lot of morbidity associated with this operation. So we do need to continue to advance our surgical technique and our surgical instrument technology. And it's also, I think it's very, very important that all the centres collect their own data, their own outcome data, and don't quote to patients, you know, in, uh, data, outcome data from big American academic centres who are operating on a completely different patient compared to ours. So we should all be collecting our own information and using that information to counsel patients. So, is it better? Well, I think there's definitely a, advantages to me. Uh, I perceive there's an advantage. It makes my life easier. It is minimally invasive, but so is laparoscopic prostatectomy. Uh, it does offer an opportunity for a faster recovery, both in hospital and post-discharge. There is less blood loss, and that's partly due to uh, the pneumoperitoneum and partly due to a more refined technique. Improved positive margin rates in T2, pathological T2s, perhaps. It's not conclusive. But there are disadvantages. It's expensive and there's definitely a learning curve. And if you're an open, if you're a surgeon who can do open prostatectomies very well, why would you want to go and learn how to do it robotically and start on another learning curve if you've got good outcome data? And a lot of a lot of British and European urologists are asking themselves that question. Why should I go back and put myself at the beginning of another learning curve? So is it better? What do you think? Who thinks it's better? <laughs> who thinks it's the same as an open prostatectomy? And who, who thinks open prostatectomy is still the gold standard? <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. Can we have the lights on again, please? Bill, that was a very nice presentation, and I'm sure one of the things that we've seen there is a complete triumph for marketing on insurance. Yeah, absolutely. It's very refreshing to hear someone who uses robotic surgery be so honest about the perceived advantages. 80% of radical prostatectomies in the States now are done robotically without any evidence to support that necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think what you pointed out there was that it was more convenient for you and there may be some perceived minor advantages. Problem, big cost, we haven't touched on training yet but we will. And when you mention the outcomes, the trifecta, the cancer outcomes and the functional outcomes, I think you can cite your evidence, can't you? Because there's a seer um, data from the States. There's a big paper there with 8,000 patients yes. where they would actually say that the continent rates of erectile dysfunction are greater with robotic surgery, maybe due to the learning curve. Yes, and that was community acquired data. So as the data I've got is from the large American academic centres, where there's an awful lot of expertise. But the data, if you look at the data from the community urology centres, the outcomes are nowhere near as good as from the big centres. And in fact, some of the outcome data from the robotics is definitely worse than the open series. 
deficit in terms of continence and recovery of sexual function. So in the UK, what we've done is we've tried to get some handle on it. There's now 20 robots in the country. Ten of them were funded from charitable monies, of which I think one from Leeds was. Yes, yes. And that has a big bearing because we've now moved on, we'll be on 20. How many do you need in this country? Should everyone have one to keep up? Mm. Or should there be a finite number which are funded ultimately from us as taxpayers for what may be very small seed benefits? I don't know the answer to that question. What I do know is we've got a, um, an application, in, uh, a, business applica a business model, asking for a robot. And you know, in this day and age, when there's not much money around, people are looking very close to it. I think you have similar experience in Leeds? Absolutely, yes. Because our machine, we purchased it in 2006, and it's, it has only got a finite lifespan, and we're probably going to have to replace it. And our managers are rightly asking the question, should we be purchasing a second one, or should we be actually bothering to replace this one? It is expensive technology, and we've got to demonstrate that there is an obvious advantage. And I think we're only going to be able to be able to obtain that evidence if we restrict the number of robots in this, in this country and we restrict the centres which do look at their outcome data. Playing the other side of that coin, Bill, there's a strategic case to be made, isn't there? Mm. Because what they do in the States, we tend to do five years later. They've switched almost lock, stock and barrel to robotics. Mm. We seem to be doing that. And the question for people like us is, if we don't switch to robotic surgery, are we going to be out of business in five years' time? Will all the radical surgery be going to the centres who have robots? So I know that our trust is looking at this, knowing that it's a financial loss, but betting on the strategic case that keeps us in the bigger frame. I think that's... Absolutely. Fair? Yes. Questions? Yes. Can I um, move from Barnet and Chase Farm? Um, oh, I've been up to the Master Class Leeds Conference over the last few years. Um, are robots on loan, and it has been since we got it at the beginning of the year, so we don't pay for it yet? <laughs> Very expensive. Pretty <laughs> crunch. There's, there's collections and funding, fundraisers yeah. and Can I just ask if you were a laparoscopic surgeon before? I did laparoscopic renal surgery as a trainee, but I didn't do any laparoscopic pelvic work, no. And can I just ask, do you do cystograms on your post No. No. No, we leave the catheter in for about 10 to 14 days. And straight Straight out. Yes. We're trying to reduce the time the catheter's in. Question? Yeah, you know, just ask, I, was, I was with the say to the way you do the laparoscopic surgery. Yes. Sorry, where are you? Where? Uh, sorry, I've got a big path. I'm trying to go in the there. Um, what would you say to patients who are off of the laparoscopic and are comparing that to the robotic? I say there's no difference. I think it's very much down to uh, the surgical team. There is no difference at all. If you've got a good, if you are going to be operated on by a good laparoscopic team, your outcomes are just going to be the same as a good robotic team. And you could take that one stage further, Bill, couldn't you? Because I think the correct answer is you would go to the surgeon who's got the best experience with whatever technique. Yes. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. Yes. Yes. John Robertson, now one of the young the charity. He did a lot of calls on the helpline from men who are considering the, these kind of options. And a number of men this year have told us that under private health insurance, they've been refused robotic surgery because the insurance company claim there aren't the outcome evidence to suggest it's any more effective. It's too expensive. We're about to see in the next 12 months or two years, Strategic Health Authorities, PCT is going under, mm. GP consortium purchasing care, What's the incentive for these consultants to purchase robotic? As John has highlighted, the, the, main, the main incentive is marketing. Uh, there are private hospitals around the country who purchase robots. But they're never ever going to make a profit. I don't think they'll ever make a profit out of performing surgery with a robot. They'll just do what the American centers have done, use it as a marketing tool, which will hopefully bring them in more, more patients for other procedures, non-robotic non procedures. I, th I think it's, it's been helpful to hear what you say because one of the most frequently asked questions we get in health is I want to take a course of technology, which is the best, which is going to be given the best outcome. And we frequently have to say, well, the records would suggest get yourself a good experience, surgeon. Absolutely. That's, I think that stands still. 
yes. and good surgical You don't team. want someone who hasn't done a, a robotic one before doing his first one on you. <laughs> well, that's for sure. But that must occur. Do you cancel patients? It's, it's surprising. Uh, when, when I started, I, I, I went to Broad to be trained, and, and then the person who trained me in Sweden came across to Leeds and spent a week, well, a week with me and then another guy from uh, Belgium came to spend a week with me. And so the first few people in the series were, there was obviously a very skilled robotic surgeon in theatre to take over if there was any problems, and obviously I've been trained as well. Uh, but when you first go solo, obviously the patient needs to know that you haven't got a mentor stood behind you, and that, that there is a high chance that the procedure will be converted to an open operation. Now, you think, well, who's going to sign up for that? Who's going to consent for that? But it's amazing. Patients do. If you're honest with them, and you actually do you know, explain that to them, and say that there is a high chance you will be converged to the open procedure, which we're obviously very experienced at, they, they will consent to it. Yes, and in your defence, Bill, we had to start doing open radical prostatectomies at one stage. Yes. I did that in Sheffield when there wasn't one done in the north of England, and you still had patients who were keen for the procedure because they believe you are trained. Yes. Well, that's the final issue, training. How many do you need to do before you're competent? Well, the American literature suggests that even with the open procedure, you need to do over 2,000 and uh, to actually get for your learning curve to start to plateau out. And there's only a handful of American surgeons who've actually performed that number of procedures. Um, so I can't see the robotic procedure being any different. Uh, there's two guys I know who've probably done over 2,000 robotic prostatectomies. But to get reasonably competent to where you're hitting figures, outcome data figures similar to what I've quoted here, you need to be doing, I've done at least 100, at least and to actually have not have done a hundred on your own and actually have visited the centre and been trained properly and all your surgical teams have been trained properly as well. But you continue to learn. Uh, but the steepest bit is definitely the first hundred. Thank you very much, Bill. I think that's a very long <laughs>